Good morning and welcome to the worship service of Big Springs Community Church. May this worship service be a nourishment to our souls uh, this Sunday, this day, and uh, throughout this week. And uh, we are um, joyful that we can be here uh, today in this uh, time of um, interesting but concerning time as uh, we are on the eve of uh, a very important election. Uh, all the announcements are in the back of the bulletin, um, and the ladies' Bible study uh, will be uh, held also this Tuesday, not until um, because of the use of the polling place, but the Bible study will be held at our uh, house, and so all the ladies are invited to uh, be there at, uh, is it 10 to 11, right? Okay, 10 to 11. And then um, Thursday, is there a sewing, sewing group on Thursday? And just a reminder that uh, the uh, holiday bazaar will be on Saturday, November 14th. Um, I mean, Sunday, November 8th, and then 15th and 22nd, um, I will do a series of sermons on the Psalms of Thanksgiving uh, to coincide with Thanksgiving season. Okay, and then uh, next Sunday, uh, we will do a lesson on uh, Christ and culture. The uh, Book of Revelation be resumed after that, probably uh, November 15th. Okay, I think um, also we have the, the new uh, devotionals in, in the back of uh, the back table there. Also, our since this is the first Sunday of the month, there will be um, building fund offering and also a fund offering. The first, uh, the, the two also. So let us stand now uh, and have a, a minute of silent prayer to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Almighty God, in this time of worship, may we forget our earthly concerns and focus on the reading, hearing, singing, and praying of your word today. Amen. God summons us to worship this morning from Psalm 99. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God greets us and welcomes us with these words. To all those in Big Springs who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful Father in heaven, there can be nothing better than to praise your name and to declare your loving kindness in the morning on your holy and blessed Sabbath day. For it is your will and command that we set aside this day to serve and praise you. Help us remember that the keeping holy of this day is a commandment which your own finger has written, that on this day we might meditate on the glorious works of creation and redemption and learn how to know and keep the rest of your holy commandments. May we hear what your Spirit will speak to us 
by the preaching of your word, may we through your blessing know in our hearts the beginning of it, that eternal Sabbath, which we will celebrate with saints and angels in unspeakable joy and glory to your praise and worship in your heavenly kingdom forever, where you dwell together with your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing a song of praise. Number 99b, we will sing, The Lord God Reigns in Majesty. As we always do, we read God's law every Lord's Day at the beginning of our worship service. God's law shows us God's holiness and our own sinfulness. And so therefore, it is our guide as to uh, godly and righteous living. And as for the unbeliever, the law directs him to a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, to a Savior from his sins. And so this is God's uh, law uh, from uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, and Peter 2, 13 to 17. So this is God's will for our lives. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then also in 1 Peter 2, 13-17, we read these commandments. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. This is God's commandments to us. And in this case, uh, especially in these times, uh, sometimes it is hard uh, to uh, obey these commandments, uh, to pray for our civil government, and to honor, respect, and obey them. 
And so we come short of God's commandments always. And so since God is perfectly holy, he demands perfect holiness from us. And this is a requirement that we can never achieve. We can never meet. And so God calls us to acknowledge, confess, and uh, repent of them. And so we have this uh, corporate prayer of confession based on uh, Daniel 9, Daniel's uh, prayer uh, to God. O Lord, our great and awesome God, who keeps the covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your prophets and apostles who spoke in your name to us. To us, O Lord, belong hope and shame because we have sinned against you. We have rebelled against you and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws. But to you, O Lord, we give thanksgiving, for you have given us mercy and forgiveness for the sake of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. God assures us that if we confess of our sins, and um, he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So again, from 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 to 6, we have this assurance. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And so we, um, we pray to this uh, one mediator between God and us Christians. And we pray to this one mediator, the man Christ Jesus, who saved us by dying on the cross for us. So we, we now come to our congregational uh, prayer. And as uh, we pray, uh, we pray together and also we pray, uh, remember, uh, who uh, think of and also about the prayer items listed in the back of the bulletin. Let us come to God in prayer. O God, your name is praised from the rising of the sun until it sets. Uh, fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit so we have knowledge and open our lips in your praise. Since you are blessed with due honor forever and ever, so you may be praised from the east to the west by all nations. Let our morning prayer rise to you, O Lord, and since you receive our praise and have compassion on our weaknesses, grant that this Lord's Day may be one of joy, peace, and rest. O Lord, first of all, we pray that you will keep your church and household especially Big Springs Community Church, continually in your truth, that all who lean on the hope of your heavenly grace alone may always be defended by your mighty power. May your word be declared faithfully and without hindrance, and that we, amending our sinful lives, may walk obediently to your holy commandments. O oh, Sovereign Lord, we pray for our nation in this coming election. As we choose our leaders, guide us by your commandments and teach us not to put our trust in mortal men who cannot save, but to trust you alone for every good and perfect gift. Lord Jesus, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you live and reign over all. Bless your church and move us to use the freedoms our nation grants us to make your gospel known in our land. Holy Spirit of life, stir our faith in your holy word so that even as we do what we can and as we seek to do your will, we trust your promise that you are our strong and mighty refuge and fortress and that you alone can work all things for the good of your holy people. 
We now pray also for those who are not able to worship with us because of sickness, travel, or for any other reason. We take to your throne of grace the sick and the suffering, the sorrowing and the afflicted, the poor and the needy. On all of these, whether they are your people or those who are outside your kingdom, pour out your good gifts, especially your mercy in faith and repentance, so they too will have <clears throat> eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, today we uh, continue to uh, read uh, the Belgian Confession of Faith, Article 36, which is the civil government. Uh, this, uh, today we will read paragraphs 6 and 7, as we have pre read previously, paragraphs 1 through 5. Paragraph 6 and 7. Moreover, everyone, regardless of status, condition, or rank, must be subject to the government and pay taxes and hold its representatives in honor and respect and obey them in all things that are not in conflict with God's word, praying for them that the Lord may be willing to lead them in all their ways and that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all piety and decency. And on this matter, we denounce the Anabaptists other anarchists, and in general all those who want to reject the authorities and civil officers and to subvert justice by introducing common ownership of goods and corrupting the moral order that God has established among human beings. So let us now sing our song of thanksgiving, Be Still My Soul, number 532. The second verse is uh, very encouraging in these times. Be still, my soul, your God will undertake 
to guide your future as he has the past, your hope, your confidence, let nothing shake. You may all be seated. Our scripture lessons for today will be from Psalm 146 and then our passage from Romans 13. The word of the Lord from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. The word of the Lord from Romans 13, beginning with verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. May God add his blessing to the reading of his most holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may hear, read, learn, and inwardly digest them, that through the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Congregation of Christ, on Easter Sunday in 1544, a group of radical so-called Protestants attacked the Roman Catholic bishop's residence in Munster, Germany, but they were repelled. This radical group belonged to a sect called the Anabaptists, which means rebaptizers, because they believed that only adults should be baptized even if they had been baptized as infants. They rejected the civil government as God's ordained authority, so they refused military service, refused taking oaths, and refused paying taxes. They believed in speaking in tongues, which were mostly gibberish, and prophetic dreams, just as Pentecostals do today. They also believe uh, in salvation by faith and works, not by faith alone. Previous to this attack against the bishop, these radicals took control of the city and imposed common ownership of goods including land and homes. They were the forerunners of communism. Those who resisted were imprisoned, tortured, and put to death. They believed that the second coming of Christ was at hand and monster was to be the new Jerusalem, where Christ would reign for a thousand years. This so-called millennium was rejected by the Protestant reformers. Jan Mathis, their leader believed himself to be the new Enoch. After Mattis was killed in this battle, another deranged man, Jan van Leyden, took over the city. He declared himself king and began his reign running wild and naked in the streets of the city. He started a reign of terror, murdering opponents, and installed 
innovations, wild innovations, including polygamy. He lived in wild excesses while the people lived in poverty. He too was killed in a battle against the Roman Catholics. Article 36 of the Belgian Confession summarizes three teachings of the scriptures, especially Romans 13, 1 to 7, regarding the civil government. The first teaching is that God himself ordained the civil government. And we took that two Sundays ago. Last Sunday, we looked at the relationship between the church and the civil government. Today, we will meditate on the third and last teaching of this article about the Christian's response to the civil government. Paragraph 7 condemns this 16th century radical Anabaptist saying, We denounce the Anabaptists, other anarchists, and in general all those who want to reject the authorities and civil officers and to subvert justice by introducing common ownership of goods and corrupting the moral order that God has established among human beings. So our theme today is the Christian and the civil government under three headings. And I would refer you to our sermon notes. So first, the civil government's task of doing justice. So Romans 13, 1 to 7 begins with the command to every Christian to be subject to governing authorities. What does be subject mean? It means that we, we must submit on and obey recognized civil authorities. In the same way that the church is subject to Christ as its head, we must be subject to the civil authorities. Why are we subject to the government? Paul grounds his command in his next statement, saying that there is no authority except from God, and they have been instituted by God and appointed by God. Paul calls civil authorities God's servants and ministers because he is their head. If citizens are subject to the civil authorities, they in turn are subject, the civil authorities are subject and accountable to God. So therefore, God has appointed them to promote justice and act justly for the well-being of their citizens. They enact laws so that, according to paragraph 1 of Article 36, so that human lawlessness may be restrained and that everything may be conducted in good order among human beings. Paul says that God appointed the authorities to be not a terror to good conduct but to bad. When they punish evildoers, they are acting as God's servants and avengers who pour out God's wrath on them. When they reward the good, they pronounce God's approval of their good deeds. God has also given civil authorities the privilege and the right to bear the sword. What does the sword mean? The sword refers to the death penalty for premeditated murder and other heinous crimes. Though there is so much opposition to the death penalty today, it goes all the way back to the recreation after Noah's flood. Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Six times. In the book of Deuteronomy, God also commanded Israel, You shall purge the evil from your midst. Even our Fifth Amendment assumes the death penalty, saying that no person shall be deprived of life without due process of law. So the civil government must act to do justice for the well-being of its citizens. So what then is our Christian response to the civil government? And that is our second point. Paul lists some responses to the civil government as God's appointed servants and ministers. We might be thinking that this is unfair for us 
to respond positively to civil authorities if they are unjust and evil. But we have learned that Paul wrote these instructions while he and all other apostles and Christians were being persecuted and martyred by the corrupt and evil Roman authorities, including Jewish authorities. The first response, as we have discussed above, is that Christians must submit and obey the civil government. The second response is, do what is good and you will receive his approval. When we are law-abiding citizens, we do not have to fear judgment by the civil authorities. For example, if we do not cheat on our taxes, we will not be afraid of getting a, a demand letter from the IRS. If we do not go speeding on the freeways, we will not be always looking out for the flashing lights of a CHP patrol car. Therefore, if we are law-abiding citizens, our reward is a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. 1 Timothy 2 verse 2. Third, we must pay taxes and whatever is due to the government. This comes from Jesus' Jesus's own teaching about paying taxes. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But what if you do not want the National Park Service to spend $65,473 to figure out what bugs do near a light bulb, or the National Institutes of Health spending $3.4 million to have hamsters fight each other in cage matches to examine their so-called aggression and anxiety. Worst of all, the federal government gives $600 million a year to plant parenthood to murder 350,000 unborn infants every year. Do you want your taxes to be spent on these horrible and ridiculous ways? However, remember that there is no government, even the best, which does not spend your tax money on immoral, evil, and ridiculous things like these. If you say you do not want to finance this evil and ridiculous things, then you should not pay a single penny to the government. Then you violate the Bible's command, and worse, you can even go to jail. Fourth, we must give respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Since the civil authorities are God's servants and ministers, we must give them proper respect and honor. Peter even affirms, honor the emperor. All of us, including myself, are guilty of violating this command, especially when we do not agree with the authorities' policies and laws. But this does not mean that we are to be like meek, silent sheep, even when our civil authorities are doing evil. As Christians, we are prophets proclaiming the truths of God's word. The prophets and apostles of old spoke the truth about the corruption and evil deeds of their civil authorities. Many of them, therefore, were persecuted and martyred for speaking the truth in love. Fifth, Christians must pray for their civil government. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2 says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions. We must pray that they may have wisdom, righteousness, and strength to know and to do God's will. We must pray that God will rule their hearts, that they, knowing whose servants they are, may above all things seek your honor and glory. Pray that they may restrain wickedness and vice. 
promote justice and virtue, and remove every obstacle to the preaching of the word and divine worship. This is Article 36, Paragraph 2. So pray also for their health and protection from their enemies and from the enemies of our nation. Six, Christians may seek civil office, even high offices. Remember that Joseph, Daniel, Esther, Mordecai, and Nehemiah held high civil offices even in foreign nations. Matthew, Zacchaeus, Cornelius, and a Roman proconsul became Christians, but still held on to their civil positions. Today, many, uh, many Christians in government uh, offices, in civil government, senators, representatives, justices, judges, mayors, governors, and other local officials, they have a salt and light influence on our nation. Seventh and last uh, duty or response of Christians to the civil government is to participate in elections. On Tuesday, we have the privilege as citizens of the Democratic Republic to choose our highest government officials. Let us vote wisely so may we may contribute to the good of our nation and live peaceable lives in all godliness and honor. As we vote, bear in mind also that all those men and women running for office are flawed, sinful people. The former editor of Christianity Today said that he will vote according to a person's obedience to the Ten Commandments. He is hopelessly mistaken because we are not electing a national pastor. We are electing a national president. We are not electing an elder of a church who must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respe uh, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. 1 Timothy 3, who among pastors and elders meet these high qualifications, who among the candidates has obeyed the whole Ten Commandments, none, not even one, not even close. Only our Lord Jesus Christ has met the requirements of the law. All of us are wretched sinners, the candidates, even the apostles, and the prophets. If this is the case, then how do we choose our civil government? We choose according to their stated policies, not in the merits and personal character of the candidate. Remember that God used evil rulers like the Pharaoh of Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Cyrus of Persia, and Constantine of Rome for the good of his people, the church, Christians, even for the promotion of godly and righteous laws. So let us now consider a few of the most important issues facing us today in this election and compare it with what the Bible teaches. So first and foremost is abortion. Abortion is murder. Period. It is a capital crime. At conception, a human being is created by God. We read David's prayer in Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Abortion started with the first trimester of pregnancy, but now has progressed even to the day of delivery 
And even after delivery, this is blatant murder in the first degree. Second, socialism and a welfare society. Many people clamor for free health care, free education, free everything, and many other handouts. The Bible condemns laziness. Paul even says that those who do not want to work should not eat. Just like the Anabaptists, they want a common ownership of goods and properties because these lazy people do not want to work. In Acts 4 and 5, chapters 4 and 5, the apostles introduce this innovation. They had everything in common, but it failed right from the beginning and was never mentioned again. So why does socialism never work? Because all of us are sinful. Third, high taxation and big government. Remember how Israel was divided into two kingdoms after Solomon died? His son, Rehoboam, became king and imposed a heavy tax burden on the people. Heavier than the heavy tax burden, Solomon left him. So Jeroboam, an official of Solomon, led a rebellion of the ten tribes, of the, of the ten of the twelve tribes that succeeded in separating themselves from Rehoboam's kingdom. All evil rulers always use heavy taxes to enrich themselves and to enrich their kingdoms. In 1 Samuel 8, we read that Israel asked God for a king, but Samuel warned them that their kings would impose a heavy tax burden on them so they would cry out to God because of their evil kings. Fourth, the fourth issue is law and order. These last six months or so have been a period of anarchy, looting, rioting, and violence in many big cities. Several of our civil authorities have actually condoned them. Some just remained silent on the matter. Just as the Anabaptists did, they are trying to take over cities by violent revolution, and they have vowed to continue their violence after the election. Most of those who have been arrested have been released to continue their violence. These civil authorities have subverted justice, according to Article 36. God condemns lying and violence, especially when committed by his people Israel. Fifth, homosexual relationships and sexual immorality in general. The Bible says this is un an abomination before God. Those who advocate this has corrupted the moral order that God has established among human beings. This moral order was established by God way back in creation when he created man as male and female and installed marriage as between only a man and a woman. This is his creation mandate from beginning to the end. Sixth, illegal aliens and open borders. From the time of the Tower of Babel, people with different languages separated from one another, establishing their own nations. Nations have borders. There has never been a time when nations do not have or did not have borders. So before an alien enters a nation, he has to ask permission from the civil authorities of that nation. Israel did when they asked the king of Edom if they could pass through this land on their way to Canaan, but they were rejected. And so they had to take a, a scenic route, a long route to the promised land. Since our nation is the most prosperous nation on earth, if we opened our borders, what would happen? 
there will be a flood of tons or tens of millions of illegal aliens rampaging into our country, and some of them will surely be violent criminals and terrorists. Many murders and other violent crimes have been committed repeatedly by illegal aliens who have been deported multiple times. Seventh and last, climate change, so-called climate change. Climate change is a hoax. Since the 1960s, there have been countless predictions of the destruction of the Earth because of so-called global warming. The polar ice cap caps would melt and flood the whole world. It would be so hot that there would be no winters and children would not know what snow is. In 2006, climate expert Al Gore predicted the end of the world in 10 years, but we're still here after four years. And just last year, some politicians have predicted the end of the world in 12 years because of climate change. Therefore, according to them, we must get rid of our oil and gas industries and our cars and stop eating hamburgers. But only God can cause climate change according to many, many verses in the Bible. Even the winds and the waves obeyed our Lord Jesus Christ. So first, the civil government must act to do justice for the well-being of its citizens. Second, the Christian must submit to and pray for the civil government and participate in civil affairs. Third and last, the Christian's hope is not the kingdoms of this world, but the kingdom of Christ. When we look at our nation, with all its problems, chaos, violence, and divisions, we may think that there is no hope. Some people have uh, trust in revolutions or socialism or economic progress or human goodness or military might, and many people st still trust in the present civil government. But there is hope. There is hope for a kingdom of law and order. There is hope for one nation without borders. There is hope for a leader who is perfectly righteous. This kingdom is the kingdom of God and Christ, a kingdom of justice and righteousness whose king, our Lord Jesus Christ, is perfectly just and righteous. It would be the kingdom of the new heaven and new earth where there would be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain because of sin because there will be no sin. And though this kingdom will have walls and gates, its gates will always be open, because no sinner will be able to enter in. All sinners will all be imprisoned in the eternal lake of torment. Therefore, as the psalmist says, put not your trust in princes, in a son of men, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. We may be able to elect good civil authorities who would rule our nation in justice and righteousness, but all earthly kingdoms are temporary and flawed, even the very best ones. But our hope rests in God's promises that he will hold all unbelieving civil authorities accountable for mistreating his people, the church. And so we must put our ultimate trust in the kingdom of God and Christ, the only perfect, everlasting, and heavenly kingdom. Let us pray. Our merciful God, who is pleased to condescend to speak to us through your word, Grant us all grace that we may not be mere hearers of your word, but doers also. Give us the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we may believe what has been proclaimed to us. 
may we bring glory and honor to your name in all that we do as you conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Speak to our hearts over and over your promises in these difficult and uncertain times in our nation. You have said, Be of good courage. Be not dismayed. I am with you. In my hand is the heart of the king. There is no authority that I have not established. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All of these, gracious Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive now God's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope.